that I'm, I'm offering myself. Uh, and what we're going to do is do a little bit. No, they want to do more. Oh, excuse me, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, we'll do that. Good. When is that? Tomorrow. Well, um, I, really, I really appreciate your being here. Thank you so much for being here. I, I appreciate this, and welcome to those people who are joining us from home. And welcome back to James. James has been in England. Uh, I'm very envious. I'm very jealous. I can't wait to hear how it went. Um, and now that he's back, we're back on track, and everything is better. So I, I'm just thrilled that, uh, that James is back, um, and I'm delighted that we're, we're able to do this. This, today, what we're going to do is have a combination of a Shavuot moment wherein we really speak about Torah and about some of the challenges of Torah, and we're going to speak about this in a way that relates to the material we've been studying, namely the five scrolls in the book of Proverbs, Mishle, and some of the prophetic literature we've been looking at as well. We're going to talk about that, some of the tensions that arise for us with Torah, but we're also going to talk about the project that we've undertaken. And the project that we've undertaken is to study Torah, to learn Torah. And do you, how many of us have reached out to me individually, uh, and sometimes in public and sometimes in private, and said, we, we don't know what to make of this. What is the relevance of this to us? What, what, what are we supposed to do with this, right? Uh, this today is, I hope, going to become the beginning of a new conversation that we're going to be holding not only about the study of Torah, what is really Talmud Torah in the way that we engage in it, but really, what do we make of the exercise? What is the value of this exercise? What does this exercise bring to us? Why are we doing this? Why are you here? Because you know, you could be somewhere else eating a cheese blinches. You could, you could be having uh, a cheesecake and a cup of coffee in one of those wonderful places out there. Uh, it's, you know, it's grown a little bit overcast, but it's really not quite so bad. And, and yet, here we are. And not only here we are, I mean, you know, we have people watching us from half a dozen states, from between half a dozen and a dozen states, and we have over 50 people watching every single session we deliver on a Sunday. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? And I want to start having a conversation that relates to Shavuot, which is the moment of Matan Torah, and really speak about this. And I'd like to speak about this not in a roundabout way, I'd like to look at two particular texts with you today, and I'm going to engage, I'm going to go out on a limb today and engage with you in a little bit of a rabbinics exercise. We're going to do some rabbinics today. We're going to read rabbinics on the Hebrew Bible and start to think about what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. And hopefully this will be the beginning of a bigger conversation. Okay? You ready? Yes? Ready to go? Okay. So, so let's go. Let's start with this. And let's think, am I supposed to be? Oh, oh good. So let's, let's talk about this and let's talk about relevance for a moment. Let's talk about relevance. So in my view, relevance entails three specific elements. Number one, recognition of the material that we're studying. And not only of the material that we're studying, but of the material that we're studying and a particular kind of value that we attach to it. 
right? In other words, if I'm not interested in architecture, if I'm not interested in science, if I'm not interested in music, if I'm not interested in art, if I'm not interested, if I do not attach value to what it is that I'm looking at to begin with, it's, to begin with, there is not going to be a relevance of the material to me. That's number one. I have to, to begin with, identify value in something that I'm looking at. Right? Number two. Number two. I have to recognize that I'm in a place in my life wherein I can make use of that value. Right? I may have a great interest in art. I may have a great interest in science. I may have a great interest in music. I may have a great interest in architecture. At this moment, I cannot take the time. I cannot bring myself. I do not have the wherewithal to bring myself to make use of what it is that I'm looking at. Right? I can't. I just can't. I cannot do it. Yes? So I have to be in a place where I can translate that value into a moment wherein I have the ability to actually address that value. And if I don't, I, I, I just don't, right? And I have to believe, and that's number three, that the value that's there out there in the material and my ability, my capacity right now to address the material, to engage with the material, to study the material, to delve into the material, to grow with the material, will bring some additional value to me in the future. Right? That's faith, right? That's, that's a leap of faith, as it were, right there. There are three elements to, rel to, elements to relevance, yes? That's when the material becomes relevant to me, yes? I'm being very simplistic about this, and this is a little bit of theory of education that I'm bringing to us in very simplistic terms, but let's talk about this for a moment. I am looking at value. I have the capacity right now to engage with this value, and I know or hope or believe or want to believe that this will help me, that this will somehow allow me greater insight, greater understanding, growth into the future. Yes? And that means that the material that I'm looking at is relevant to me. Right? Okay? Am I making any sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Forgive me for going about this in a very superficial and brief way. But, right? Okay? Yes? Does this? Okay. So now, having said this, let's go through a rabbinics exercise. Okay? You're, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of rabbinics. And I'm going to do a little bit of rabbinics with you in the context of what is uh, a very, a relatively accessible text, uh, a midrash to begin with, and then a passage of Talmud, which is also a midrash. But we're going to do some rabbinics learning in the context of a particular kind of a rabbinics argument, an argument that's used in rabbinic literature, which we're going to talk about. Okay? Bear with me. We haven't done this before. But bear with me, everybody will be able to stand up and walk out at the end of it, I promise you. Okay. Okay. We're going to start with Sifre Deuteronomy. This is Sifre Deuteronomy on uh, actually the beginning uh, of, of the book of Deuteronomy, the second, uh, the second and third Torah portions of the book of Deuteronomy. They are both, uh, they're both cited here. Uh, this is actually on the third, but it starts with the second. Uh, the, the first references to the second Torah portion of the book of Deuteronomy, which is Vait Hanan, Dvarim Vait Hanan and the Nekev, right? So we have, we have a passage here out of Sifre that speaks to us about Torah. And I want to talk to you about three things, uh, but especially two of them. I want to talk to you about Torah, and I want to talk to you about the land of Israel, and I want to talk to you about the temple. Because Shavuot was all about our bringing the gifts, the first produce of the land, to the temple. Shavuot, as you know, 
is one of the pilgrimage holidays. And so the land of Israel and the temple and Torah are all interconnected completely, interwoven with Shavuot. Yes? So I, I want to start with that. And I want to start with a really simple and accessible text that raises some real complexities and difficulties for us. Here we go. Um, when the children of Israel left Egypt, at the time of the exodus from Egypt, according to Sifre here, according to the Midrash, according to the rabbis, at the time of the exodus from Egypt, God said to the children of Israel, right, you're going to bring, I'm going to bring you to this land to inherit it, to the land of Israel to inherit it. Now, the, the rabbis here are playing a game with us, right? Of course, this is the book of Deuteronomy, all right? If it said that in the Torah portion of the Exodus, we would have read it in the Torah portion of the Exodus. What are the rabbis here saying? We're reading this back to the moment of the Exodus, and God says, I, I'm going to lead you into this land to inherit it if you follow my laws. Follow what I'm telling you, and I will lead you to this land to inherit it. Now, the notion of it being cited during the time of the Exodus, bringing it back to the Exodus, is important. We're going to come back to it. Just bear this in mind. Think about this for a moment. Bear this in mind. Okay? And then, what were the children of Israel thinking? What were these slaves who were about to be liberated at the time of the Exodus thinking? What were people thinking? Is the new place going to be better than the old place? Are we going into the same kind of land? Or are we going into a worse land? Are we going into a better land, right? In other words, what were we thinking at the time of the Exodus? What kind of thinking were we engaged in? What were we thinking? Is this good news? Is this bad news? Is this neutral? What's in it for me? I don't know what I'm getting into. If I am going on a journey, what is the destination of this journey? Is the destination any better off? Right? Am I going to be better off? Right? Did your, did your forefathers and foremothers come from the old country, from somewhere in Europe? Yes. Did they know what they were going to? Did they have an idea of where they were going to? Did they go on a journey? Yes. Did they go to what once was called in the old country, the Golden Medina, right? The place where we believed it was going to be better. Why are we going on a journey? Why do we go on a journey? To, to do better. To go better, right? In our case, it was to live. But to live better, right? In other words, we're talking about the Ukraine, we're talking about all, all these other places. Did we not live? Yes, we lived. But to live better, right? To, to live and to live better. Why do we go? Why do we get up and go? To do better, right? Out of faith that we're going to do better. Why do we go on a journey of learning? Again, it's the same journey. We're going in order to do better. This is about the journey of life and about the journey of Torah. They were asking themselves, this is the first thing they say here at the moment of the Exodus, here according to Sifre. Very insightful. There's a great deal of insight here. Where are we going to? Is it going to be any better or any worse? Is it going to be the same? Egypt isn't so bad, you know. It's a nice country. It's a, it's a, you know, there's the Nile, there's fresh water, there are fields, there's plenty of food. Um, it, it's not bad, right? The center of civilization at the time. Um, you know, if we're going to leave Egypt, what are we going to? Yes? Okay. And then God says to the children of Israel, you're not just going to go to another neutral place. You're going to go to a better place. Right? You're going to go to a better place. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. Uh, 
Um, the rabbis here go through this process. I've, I've doctored the translation of it. I, I suffer from the translations. Um, but the rabbis talk about this notion of the superiority of the land of Israel. What does the superiority of the land of Israel here mean? Right? Um, and here I'm going to, to ask you to bear with me because this is where it gets a little bit complicated and we're getting into the rabbinics exercise. I, I want to I wanna ask you this. Um, in the Torah portion of the spies, you remember the spies, the 12 spies that were sent to the land of Israel to look in the book of Numbers, which we're now in. So this is something we're going to be reading uh, shortly. But in, in the Torah portion of the spies, uh, there is a description of the travel of the spies into the land of Israel and into the area of Hebron. There is a description there. You can turn to, to Numbers uh, 13 there and take a look at this, right? And, uh, and we're going to, to talk about this for a moment. I just want you to take a look at Numbers 13 and look at what it says in the context of Numbers 13 and what happens there in number th Numbers 13. The, the spies go into the land of Israel and they ascend, they go up to the area of Hebron and then the Hebrew text, the biblical text, speaks to us of produce that they bring back from the land of Israel. Does anyone, can you see this, chapter 13, around verse 22? Do you see this? What does it say? What does it say? It says, Hebron, the lowest grade soil in Canaan, the land of Israel, was superior sevenfold no, what? to... That's what it says here in the Midrash. That's what the rabbis write. But what does it say in the Hebrew Bible? What did they do? They, what did they bring from Hebron? The area of Hebron. What did they bring? What did they find? What does it say there? What kind of grapes? Yeah. Grapes, pomegranates, a whole number of other things. And how did they bring the grapes back to the, the other people who were outside there who were, who were back in Egypt. How did they bring them back? What did they do with these grapes? They took down the branch. Right? In a single cluster, do you remember the image of this? Do you know what we're talking about? What, what kind of grapes were they? Were they small, tiny grapes they were just carrying? in the, Huh? What, what are we looking at? Huge. They were huge, big grapes. Huge, big grapes. And palm, you remember people carrying them, the two people carrying the branch of grapes? Right? On the vine. Yes, remember that? Yes. And you, what did they see? What did, why, why do we think that they were big grapes? Why do all the representations say that they were big grapes? What else did they find there around Hebron? Rich soil? R well, it must have been rich soil. It must have been amazing, right? It must have been incredible soil in order to grow this kind of stuff. But what else did they find there? People who looked like giants. People who looked like giants. In other words, the soil sustains people who look like giants. And what do giants eat? What do we interpret giants to need? Large food, a lot of food, a great deal of food. So the fruit must be bigger, right? Everything must be bigger, right? It's kind of like America. Everything is bigger in America, right? Every, so, so what you have here is our interpretation of what happened in Hebron in a land that sustains people that look like giants. Yes? This is Hebron, right? Now, the Midrash here tells us, 100% right, that what Hebron is, is the refuse or the leftover of the land of Israel, right? So Hebron, the land that sustains giants, wherein there's giant fruit and the giant grapes and the pomegranates and all this other amazing stuff that's being brought back to the children of Israel to show them in the desert, right, is the lowest of the low of the land of Israel. Right? Yes? According to the Midrash here. Yes? Okay, you see that? Okay. And, right, and the highest grade soil in the land of Egypt... The highest grade soil 
where the Israelites are leaving from is a place called Tso'an. And Tso'an, we learn in the book of Isaiah, was where the kings and the officials lived, and it stands to reason that they would live in the best place in Egypt. Right? The finest place in Egypt. Right? Okay. Hebron, therefore, is the worst place, according to the Midrash, the worst place in the land of Israel, and Soan is the finest place in Egypt. Yes? Yeah? Do you see the premise of the Midrash? Are you still with me? Yes? Are we? Okay. Good. We're doing well. Okay. How do we know? On what basis do we know this? Why do the rabbis say this? They say this because of Genesis chapter 10. Now I need you to go to Genesis chapter 10. Now this is where it gets interesting. Genesis chapter 10. Right? What is Genesis chapter 10? Does anyone remember Genesis? What Torah portion are we in? Noah. We're in the Torah portion of Noah. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the children of Noah. Noah and his descendants. Right? Okay. What does it say there in Genesis chapter 10 about Hebron and about Tzoan? What does it say? What does it say? I'm in chapter 10, verse 6. What does it say? With the descendants of Ham. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. The descendants of Ham. Yes. Cush, Mizraim, Hoth, and Canaan. Yes. Mitzrayim, right? Excellent. Very good, right? The descendants of Ham, right, are Canaan and Cush, right, and and, um, and Mitzrayim, right? Okay. Now, Ham, Ham, we know from chapter ten, built Hebron and built Tzoan. And we know that Hebron was built seven years before Tzoan. Okay? You, are you with me? Yes. Now, if you're going to build something, and you have, you're, you're, you're about to build something, you're collecting your materials... You build something with the best materials you can find, according to the rabbis, right? Then you're going to build something else. You're going to build something else with the leftovers, with what's left over from your first building project, right? In other words, your first building project is going to be the fine building project. Whatever you're going to be building next, you're going to be building the first building project is complete. You're building it with the leftovers, right? If Hebron was built before Tzoan, seven years before Tzoan, Hebron must be finer than Tzoan because Tzoan was built with the leftovers of the materials from Hebron. Right? Yes? Think about, the, think about this for a moment. Right? Think about the rabbinic analysis here. Right? Yeah? It's a little bit difficult to follow. I know. Okay. Well, you get it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Right? In other words, the worst of the land of Israel, Hebron, is better than Soan, which is the finest, out of Egypt. Right? But it's not only better. It's earlier. It's original. It's first. The land of Israel here is not only does not only have primacy because it is better. It has primacy because it comes chronologically 
first. Now, this is really important. What is the implication of this? What are we saying here? The closer we go back to creation, the closer we go back to the Garden of Eden, the closer we go back to the time of Noah, the closer we go back to those moments, the closer we are to God, the closer we are to divinity. The, the further back we go, the closer we are to that which was the source of of our lives today. The further back we descend, the further forward we go, the further away we are and the more diluted that force is in our lives. Yes? Does that make sense? It's, it, part of it is biblical and part of it is rabbinic. It actually does say in the biblical text, in the book of Numbers, and then in, in Joshua, and I, I'm not going to take you through all of these texts, that Hebron was built seven years before Tzoan. And we know that, you know, Ham, the descendants of Ham, Canaan, were the ones who built Hebron and Tzoan, Right? So if we, we put all of this together, right, we know that Hebron was built seven years before Tzoan and that it's original. And it's the last since, again, do the reasoning here, follow the reasoning with me. If Hebron is the refuse or the leftover of the land of Israel, it stands to reason it was the last piece of the land of Israel to be built, right? Again, it was the leftovers. It was the refuse. Like Tzoan is the leftovers of Hebron, right? Yes? In other words, Hebron was the last place to be built, to be constructed in the land of Israel, and is superior to Tzoan, which is the first to be built in Egypt, and the finest in Egypt, which is the place where the officials live. Yes? According to this reasoning, right? In other words, it's not only a superiority in quality, but in time. It's a matter of chronology, right? And of closeness to the creation, right? Are you with me? We're still, yes? Okay, this is still making some sense? Good, okay. Now, this, this is our starting point. This is the starting point, which leads us to a rather difficult place. And here is the place that we're going to, and it's a little bit complicated, it's a little bit difficult, and we're going to talk about it. Because it was built first, and this is very clearly stated, Hebron and the soil in Hebron is superior to that of Tzoan. Now, built first doesn't mean the houses. It means the whole, everything. The soil, the wall, everything. By the way, uh, has anyone been to Hebron? Have you been to Hebron? Yeah. Yes. Um, did you see massive grapes in Hebron? No. Uh, did you see these massive pomegranates in Hebron? You know, Hebron has a real problem of water. Hebron has always had a real problem of water. Hebron is not an agricultural, um, you know, um, so uh, there is a real irony in all of this being discussed with regard to Hebron. But we're going to leave that aside for a moment. For those of you who have been to Hebron, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting, uh, anyway. Um, uh, think about the comparison now between the whole of Egypt and the whole of the land of Israel. If Hebron, according to the biblical description, which is the worst of the land of Israel, is so much superior to Tzoan and to Egypt, think about the land of Israel as compared to Egypt. Right? The land of Israel is first, and the land of Israel is superior. Right? Um, is this consistent with our understanding of the story of creation? Yes? yes? 
uh, that the land of Israel is superior? So the land of Israel, according to the story of creation, was created first. When God created the land and separated the water of the sea from the land and so on and so forth, that first happened with regard to the land of Israel. And then everything else formed. Is that what we know? No, I'm asking the question. It may be. I mean, it says so here, right? But it's unclear to us from the, story of the, from the story of Genesis. In the story of Genesis, the world is created at the same time. There is no one superior land, one inferior land, one land that was created first, one land that was created second. I mean, the notion of the land of Israel being created first is a little bit strange just in the context of what we just learned in the story of creation. Um, there is something that is a counter-narrative here, right, that is taking place. In other words, we think about the earth in the story of creation as neutral, as all being created by God. The earth in itself, right, there is no better place and worse place. The earth is all is all one, one thing, right? It's all being created at the same time. Here, we have a very different view of the world, and the view of the world is the world was created in parts, right? And does anyone... Um, <laughs> there is, there, I, I, this is a parenthetical comment. There is a very wonderful legend in France regarding the Loire Valley. Does anyone know about this? Has anyone been to the Loire Valley and the chateaus, the, 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 the wonderful... I mean, have you been there? It's the most magnificent area. It's lush and green, and there are chateaus along this valley of the Loire that dot the valley of the Loire, and one is more beautiful than the other. And the leg legend has it, and it's fascinating, this French legend has it, that after God created the world, he had these palaces that were left over, <laughs> and he sprinkled them onto the Valley of the Loire. And the Valley of the Loire, you know, now has these, right, as if they didn't take all of these workers and uh, uh, all of these people to build and, you know, the, but, but the notion that the Valley of the Loire received this amazing gift of palaces, of beauty from God, not because it was first, but because it was last and because these palaces were left over. Here, it's because it was first. Yes? Here, it's the land of Israel has primacy, it is first, and the land of Israel is superior to the land of Egypt. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 8. This, again, now, now we're starting to talk. Here is, here is our theology according to Sifre. This is what Sifre tries to teach us. That which is earlier is more beloved by God. In order to be more beloved by God, in order to have preference, it has to be earlier. That which was created earlier is closer to God. Yes? Okay? You, you, you see what is happening here? Yes? Okay, so take a look at this, right? And take a look at what is created first, what was created before the world, according to the book of Proverbs and then rabbinic theology. What was the first thing that God came up with before God ever created the world? Anything in the world? Life. Torah. Everything was created according to Torah. Torah, if you like, is the blueprint of the world. How did God go about creating the world? On the basis of Torah. Torah precedes everything. Now look at Proverbs chapter 8. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. And we have a little bit of a problem here. What is the problem that we encounter with regard to Proverbs chapter 8? Look at what the text of Sifre tells us here, right? Torah, the most beloved of all, precedes all. 
As it is written, God acquired me in the beginning of God's way before God's works of yore. Right? Verse 22. And then we go to 23. I was poured out from everlasting, from the beginning, from the origin of the earth. Right? What precedes absolutely everything? Torah. Yes? But you read Proverbs chapter 8 and tell me, where in Proverbs chapter 8 is Torah mentioned? Nowhere. There isn't a single mention of the word Torah in Proverbs in Mishle chapter 8. Rather, what is the Hebrew word that is mentioned there? What is it that is mentioned in Proverbs chapter 8? What is it that preceded the world? Chokhmah. Wisdom. Now we have a problem. Here is your example of a rabbinic sleight of hand. Now we're getting to the rabbinic exercise here. So, for the moment, we're equating Chokhmah and Torah, wisdom and Torah. Right? For the time being, we're equating Chokhmah and Torah. But the rabbis are counting on us to read Proverbs chapter 8 and to know that we're not talking about Torah, we're talking about Chokhmah. Right? Here, suggesting to us in Sifrei that Torah was created before anything in the world was created and therefore is the most beloved by God. It is the closest to God. How do you get closest to God? Through wisdom, wisdom or Torah. Right? Yes? And where do you get closest to God? Now follow the reasoning here. Where do you get closest to God? Geographically? In the land of Israel because the land of Israel is created first. Right? Yes? Do you see the reasoning? Do you see what is happening here? Torah is Chokhmah here, yes? And the land of Israel is first. If the land of Israel is first, Torah was first, then the land of Israel. Geographically, where do you get closest to God? In the land of Israel, right? Now, he, here is, right? Here we go. The temple. I told you we were going to talk about the temple, right? So the temple, the most beloved of all, was created before all. Why was the temple created before all? It's described in the Torah. The measures of the temple are in the Torah. The plans, the blueprints of the temple are in the Torah. Before any other structure was built, the temple was already described in the Torah. It was already thought about in the Torah. God already designed the temple in the Torah, right? Okay, again, what comes first is, is preferred. We're closer to God, right? Yes? Why is Shavuot Chag Matan Torah? Why is Shavuot Chag? Why are we associating the giving of the Torah with Shavuot? Because it is a pilgrimage to the temple In the land of Israel. with the produce, the first produce, the first produce from the land of Israel. So here you are coming with the first produce from the land of Israel to the temple, the first edifice that God created here through the Torah. And here you, and all of that, right, is on the basis of what we need to do through Torah. This is the very first harvest, right, of Torah. Everything is a first here. Yes? Therefore, the giving of the Torah associated with Shavuot. You see, you see how the theology here functions. Do does, does every? Am I making sense? Is this still? Am I still speaking English? I, yes. Okay. I just I just want to make sure. I'm sorry. Except when I talk about France, yeah. But uh, but is this? But does this still make any sense to you? Do you understand the way we are thinking about this? Yes. And therefore, the superiority of Torah, the superiority of the land of Israel, the superiority of the temple, written by rabbis who are not in the land of Israel when the temple is destroyed, right? But this is the theology. This is what we're what we're talking about. Yes, yes. Do, am, am I making? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, the other side of it 
is the more disturbing piece of it. Take a look at Proverbs chapter 8. Take a look at the Proverbs, and God says here, God had not yet made land and environs. I hate this word, environs, right? It's what's the land and outside the land, right? God had not yet created the land and the outside, right? In other words, the land, the land of Israel, and what is outside? Inferior. The land first and what is outside after. The land comes first in the verse, what is outside comes after, right? I, I, I don't want to get into the Hebrew of it. It's amazing. It's wonderful. There's a great deal of insight and wisdom in this, but again, superiority, inferiority, right? Remember, chosenness, that entire theology. Yes? Okay. Which leads us to even greater heights, or if you like, greater depths, um, right? Because it's all, I think, disturbing. Um, okay. It's interesting. The Tanakh writes it as, he had not yet made earth and field. That's right. L Eretz, right? The chutzot, right? Which is not fields. It is outside. It is, it, 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 right? Again, the translations here are... That's what I mean. I know. I, 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 I struggle with this all the time. You're right. Uh, I know. I struggle with this. You're right. I struggle with this all the time. Now we're back. We're back here to Sifri. The chief of the class of Tevel, the world, Tevel is a, is a, is a Hebrew word, taf vet lamed, for the world, for, for right? Um, the land of Israel, as it is written, God rejoices uh, in God's land with Tevel, right? Now, we're, we're in the same place. You can Continue to go back, right? God rejoices God's land with Tevel. In other words, God uh, allows for joy in the land with Tevel, which is inserted into the land. The whole universe, the whole world is inserted into the land, right? In Tevel, the, the word in Hebrew means a mixture, a mix, right? Like a mix of herbs, a mix of that is Tevel, right? Okay? Um, and and what we mean by this is the land of Israel lacks nothing. It has everything of the entire universe in it. Which is, you know, and it was created first, which means that everything else was created with the leftovers. So the land of Israel has everything, absolutely everything in it. And how do I know this? Because I know Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 9, and in Deuteronomy chapter 8 it says, you will lack nothing in it. Right? In other words, the land of Israel has everything in it. If you've been to the land of Israel, you know. It has absolutely everything in it. Right? And in this respect, it's superior. Right? It's, yeah. Is this all rooted in the psychology of the rabbis who are so longing for Israel? So... They need to feel superior? And down harder than they are? Um... Let me rephrase the question also for the people who are at home. What is this rooted in? I, I'm going to place. I'm going to ask your question very differently, and I'm not using your words, Margie. And I want to specify for the people at home that I'm not using your words because you didn't say this. I am saying this. Um, is this rooted in arrogance? Is this rooted in a sense of superiority? Is this rooted in a sense of somehow chosenness that others do not enjoy? Or is this rooted in some kind of longing, in some kind of need, in some kind of a passion for something that is no longer, in maybe a romanticized past, maybe something that we yearn for that we believe might have existed, a kind of Camelot? a kind of what might have been, and therefore a return to the past, right? Because for us, even if it's a mythical past, it's a past, right? What is this about? And, and the corollary to that question, did the rabbis not know that this was deeply offensive? 
Did the rabbis not understand that when they were living in Babylonia writing this, and when they knew that they were writing this, they, they understood that they were writing this to their brothers and sisters who were living in Egypt. They knew there was a Jewish community in Egypt. They were living in, in Persia. They knew that there were people who were going to read this in Egypt. They knew there were people who were going to read this in Asia Minor. They knew there were going to be people. Who, there were Jews at that time who were living in these different places. How were they going to interact with their neighbors? What, what were they going to be believing about their neighbors? In other words, what were they thinking when they were writing this? Right? And what does it tell us about Torah? And by the way, what does it tell us about Torah that we want to go back to the past? And not only to the past, to some kind of a mythical past. Right? What does it... Wait a minute. Is this who we are? And the rabbis say, in certain ways, yes. We, we are beings, we are human beings, who are filled with longing. Longing. And we're filled with longing for things that did for us, that do represent the past. That sometimes represent our youth that sometimes represent our parents' and grandparents' youth, that sometimes represent a golden age. Think for a moment about what's happening in this country right now. And the feeling here that we have of post-golden age. And where different people think about the golden age of this country. When do they place it? How many people have you I how many people have you come across I have just this is just my experience this weekend of people who have spoken to me about the 1950s and this country as a golden age No I'm serious this is not and an age look and I I looked at these people and I said to them you mean the cold war you mean the threat of nuclear war? You mean children in school going through exercises where they were hiding under their desks in case of, I mean, this, but at the same time, a time that was imbued with economic growth, with the building of suburbs, with the building of highways, with, with the hope of a better world moving, in other words, and in certain ways, and, and, and not necessarily a golden age with regard to Jews, and the ability of Jews to buy homes, you know, in, 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 in a whole number of different places, and to, to work in different places, and to integrate in different ways, let alone other people, you know, that I, we're not, we're not going to even go there. But think about this for a moment, right? Think about this for a moment. In part, it's memory, and it's part, in part, it's romanticized. It's what we remember, and what we, how we reconstruct the... The whole of the past is romanticized. All of our memory, right, is reconstructed. Yes? Which leads us to the point of all of this, right? And here I'm going to ask you again to turn your, your, your Bibles, right? Okay? Joshua, yeah, we're Joshua chapter 20, Kiryat Arba, right? is Hebron, the, the Hebron is understood to be, we're back to Hebron, the refuse of the land of Israel. Kiryat Arba is Hebron. Why? Because four kings fought over it. If four kings fought over it, then how much, how valuable was Hebron, right? And this is the lowest of the low in the land of Israel, right? Okay? This is the lowest of the low in the land of Israel. Uh, this is Joshua chapter 20. I'm conscious of time here. And now we are moving forward. Um, and we're back to Sifre, we're back to the Midrash on Deuteronomy. How else do you describe the universe, Tevel? What else can we say about the word Tevel? It is that it is associated with the word Tavlin, the rabbis say, which means seasoning. 
right? The seasoning mixed into the land of Israel. And what seasoning is this? It is Torah, okay? Now, remember we looked at the scroll of Lamentations. Remember we looked at Echa, right? You remember we studied Echa. Go to Echa chapter 2. Now, we, this we need to look at carefully. This we really need to read. Go to Lamentations chapter 2 and tell me what Lamentations chapter 2 is about from the beginning of the chapter to verse 9. Tell me what this is about. Read this for a moment and tell me what is happening here in Lamentations. What page are we on? Does anyone have the page number? 1428. 1428, page 1428 in our books. Tell me what is happening in Lamentations. What happened to Jerusalem? Jerusalem was destroyed. Zion was destroyed. What happened to its people? Its people were ravaged and exiled and expelled, right? What happened to the political class in chapter 2? Decimated. Decimated, right? Look at this. This is Echa. This is the destruction of Jerusalem, right? The destruction of Judah, the destruction of absolutely everything, right? Yes? yes? Okay. Now you go through the beginning of the chapter, right from the beginning, all the way to verse 9, and it's utter destruction. Not only is it utter destruction, it gets worse. It gets progressively worse, right? What does it say in the beginning of the chapter, chapter 2? The Lord, God in His wrath, right? What happened with God in His wrath? I'm sorry? Yes. 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 The God, the God, was, God was angry. God offended Israel. God did not remember Israel. How does it proceed? How does it continue? Read, read verses. Okay. Then laid waste without pity. Okay, it's worse. Laid waste without pity, right? Okay, then re read verses 4 and 5. What does it say in verse, verses 4 and 5? Like an now, like an enemy, like a foe, right? Like an, you see what is happening here. This is the equivalent of crescendo in music. This is, you are reading this. You're reading this chapter. And it's the description of God is from bad to worse. It's this, you are reading this, and it becomes more intense, and the words are more difficult to read the more you grow, you go into the chapter, right? And the chapter starts out shocking. By the time you get to verse 8, 9, my hair is standing on end. I mean, I, I am having trouble reading this. This is difficult for me to read. Every Tisha B'Av, this is, this is tough stuff, right? Now you get to verse 9. Now read verse 9 carefully. Now I need us to read it. What does verse 9 say? Can someone read it? Her, her gates have sunk into the ground. He has smashed her bars to bits. Her king and her leaders are in exile. Instruction is no more. Torah. Yeah. Ain Torah. Torah is no more. In other words, the word instruction here, it's Torah. Is it? Torah is no more. Ain Torah, right? Yes. Her prophets, too, received no vision from the Lord. There are no, there's no prophecy anymore. There's no more prophecy. The prophets, are, they're, 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 they have nothing to go on. They're not receiving anything from God. There's no more message coming from God. The line is silent. The line has gone dead, right? There's no more prophecy because the prophets are here. They're, they're, they're not receiving anything, right? Look at the description here. What does it say? In, 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 in verse 9. What does it say in verse 9? Now, before the words, Ein Torah, what does it say? 
What does it say at the beginning of the, ch of the verse? This is really important to us. What does it say? Everything is sunk. The, the gates are sunk into the ground. The bars, the gates of the city, the reinforcements of the city have been smashed, right? Yes, and? We're cut off from God, okay? No so let's take a look at this. Do you have it in Hebrew, Jeff? Yes. Bagoyim Malka Vesareha Bagoyim. It the king and the ministers, the officials, are among the nations. Yes. Right? They are exiled, they are expelled among the nations, and then the words come Ain Torah. I, I'm not inventing this. This is in the, right? Malka v'sareha v'agoyim ein Torah. Right? This is what it says. This is how we read it. Jerusalem is destroyed, completely destroyed. The first, the holiest, the superior. Right? This is also the temple. The temple is destroyed. Remember we went through this in Lamentations. Yes? The king and the officials have been expelled among the nations. There is no Torah. What do the rabbis do? They take the word among the nations, vagoyim, and they read among the nations there is no Torah. The verse reads, the verse here in Echa reads, the king and the ministers are expelled. They are among the nations. They are now, they've been removed from the land, and those who are alive were taken prisoner and expelled among the nations. They are among the nations, right? And then we read, Ein Torah, there is no Torah anymore. There's no Torah. Okay. The king and the officials are among the nations, comma. There is no Torah, period. Actually, semicolon, because we continue. Right? Right? But this is what it says. This is what the verse says. What do the rabbis say? Everything has been smashed. The gates the bars, the reinforcements of the city have been smashed. The king and the officials. There is no Torah among the nations. This, this, and the word in Sifre is Torah, right? The word in Sifrei consistently is Torah, right? And the word in Echa is Torah, right? Now, remember Proverbs, what we looked at a moment ago? Yes, remember Mishlei, chapter 8. Was the word Torah used in Mishlei? Not once in chapter 8. It was Chochmah. It wasn't Torah. Right? The rabbis equated Chochmah and Torah. Mishlei says Chochmah was there before the world was created. The rabbis put in the word Torah and they wanted us to notice it. Right? But here the rabbis are saying something else. Not only are we expelled among the nations, but there is no Torah among the nations. In other words, among the nations, we are hopeless. So now, I want to wish you a happy Shavuot. <laughs> There's no Torah. We're among the nations. We're not in the land of Israel. There is no first produce. There is no temple. There is nothing. Um, have a great day. Wonderful. What are we doing here? Remember where we started? We started with the question of relevance. 
We started with the question of relevance. Now here is a great, here's a great way to sell the study of Torah. It's wonderful, right? What is Torah about? It is about that which comes first in the land of Israel, in Jerusalem, in the temple, right? And it's about being close to God in a way that we cannot be. Now, do you understand what the rabbis have done here? Do you understand how destructive this is? Do you see how problematic this is? And it's not that the rabbis don't know. Of course they know. They know absolutely what they're doing and what they're saying. They get this. Yes? This is a stretch, probably. But in, in writing about, about first and being first and, and everything that, and then you come up with that, could it be a convoluted way of saying, only when we return to Israel will we have a temple, will we have a Torah, will we have, and we've got nothing here, we have to go back and return and rebuild. Yeah, that's wonderful. We have to go back and return and rebuild and all the rest of it. It's 2,000 years in the diaspora. 2,000 years. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. The second temple was this, it's never too late. But what in the meantime? What, no Torah? No survival? No hope for us? Nothing? What are we going to learn? What are we going to do? What's going to be relevant to our lives? Are you in the land of Israel right now? Mentally, maybe. But Mentally, maybe, but not right? I mean, what, and the home of Torah is the land of Israel. Right? What are we doing? We're, you want us to celebrate Shavuot? What are we celebrating? What does this mean? What do you make of this? Do you understand what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. Look at this. I mean, at a certain level, it's offensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. And where are the rabbis writing this? They're in Babylonia. They're in Babylonia, producing Torah. The irony, the irony, yes. You're going back to your history. This is you, but where's hope? Where's hope for the future? You're, wonderful point, excellent point. It's about assimilation. This is a way to fight assimilation. Know who you are. Know where you come from. Know your past. There was an Israel. There was a temple. There was a Jerusalem. There is a locus for Torah, which is the land of Israel. The home of Torah is the land of Israel, right? Yes, know who you are. Don't lose this. Don't assimilate, right? This is, remember where home was, right? And we pray to the land of Israel, we point to the land of Israel, and we read the Torah. But what about my children who are growing in Beechwood? No, what, what, about, what, what, about, what, what about our family? Look at what it says here. I mean, how, how, should, how are we supposed to interpret this? Do, do you understand the, the question and the problem? Yes. It just seems that as they're saying that, they're totally preoccupied with Torah. They're completely preoccupied with Torah. They're completely, pre they produced this text. What is this text that they're producing? They're producing a text of Torah. But they have played a game. A remarkable game. They knew we would be sitting here on Shavuot talking about this. Right? They, they anticipated this. And there's a remarkable lilt that they offered this text. And the hinge of this text is the book of Proverbs chapter 8. It doesn't say Torah. Where do we start from? We start from chokhmah. We start from wisdom. 
Where does it say that the house of wisdom is the land of Israel? It doesn't. Where does it say that there is no wisdom among the Gentiles? among the nations. It doesn't, right? In other words, what is it that at the end of the day for us is going to be the source of relevance? Where is the value that we're going to be attaching to Torah? Not Torah as in the Torah that wh whose home is the land of Israel. What is the value that we're going to be attaching to Torah as the parallel to Torah, the equivalent to Torah? Chokhmah. Wisdom. Right? Yes? In other words, look at what the rabbis have done here. They have, they have left us, they left us this clue in the middle of this paragraph. This is all one paragraph out of a 37 paragraph chapter in this section of Sifre, right? In other words, the, uh, we're looking at one paragraph here, right? And look at how they've constructed this paragraph. They've left us this clue, and the clue is wisdom is Torah. Wait, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. We're talking about wisdom being Torah. Not the Torah that was given that's whose home is the land of Israel. Now think about wisdom, Right? And think about the equivalency of wisdom and Torah and the wisdom that in the book of Proverbs precedes the creation of the world, precedes absolutely everything. Yes? Yes? Are we together? Yes. Okay? Yes. To all mankind, it's universal. And by the way, not only here in chapter 8, in the book, chapter 2 of the book, of, I mean, the whole of the book of Proverbs. Remember, we went through this. We studied this. The book of Proverbs is a wisdom literature, is a book of the wisdom literature. It's universal. It speaks to the universal value of wisdom. Remember, we spoke about this. Yes? Yes? Yes. This is part of, this is it. Absolutely, absolutely. And they are creating for us this tension within this one paragraph. Yes, the particular and the land of Israel versus wisdom in the book of Proverbs. They, we know the book of Proverbs. They know that we know the book of Proverbs. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. You're, now we're into rabbinics. This is rabbinics, right? Okay? The idea here through this text is to offend us, is to push us into what really did they mean? How could they possibly have written that? What could this possibly be to really truly understand what it is that they're saying? There must be a meaning here. Of course there is. Look, they didn't write this in the land of Israel. By the time they were writing this, there was very little in the land of Israel. Right? They knew exactly what they were doing. Okay, so now, what do we do with Torah? Um, and what do we do with Torah for us? And what does it mean for us? I'm going to leave you with really a brief, very brief, I promise. Uh, I'm not going to keep you long. Um, what, how long do I have? Oh boy, uh, I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to leave you with another Talmudic story that speaks to our ability to receive Torah. Okay? And it comes from Tractate Tanit. And it comes from page 7 of Tractate Tanit. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. And within a few minutes, I'm going to let you go. And wish you a happy, happy Shavuot. Take a look at this. Um, this is very simple. Um, Rabbi Hanina right, uh, um, uh, asked about Torah being likened to water, right? Uh, and, and here is the response to what we started out with. Uh, like water that flows from high places to low places, it never flows the other way. Water never flows from a low place to a high place. It always flows from a high place to a low place, right? So is Torah. Torah may start from a high place, 
But at the end of the day, where does water collect? And where does water collect in a low place? Where does Torah collect? In a low place. In other words, for us to truly be the recipients of Torah, where it truly collects, where should we be? And not only that, Torah is likened to water, to wine, and to milk. Now, water is completely natural. Water <laughs> comes, water is completely natural, right? Uh, Rainwater, river, I mean, it's there in nature, right? Milk is natural but occurs periodically and it is associated with procreation, right? All milk is always associated with procreation, whether it is for human beings or for other animals, for mammals, right? Milk is associated, so it's part of the natural process. But milk isn't there all the time. Milk is there in association with procreation. It's part of nature. But it's not part of nature generally. It's part of the animal world. It's part of mammalian world. Yes? OK? So it's more specific. And wine, wine is derived from nature but requires human labor. It requires an art. It requires a craft. It requires the make. Wine is a luxury product. Wine, I mean, you, you, the grapes are there. Yeah, you can pick the grapes and eat them. But that's not wine. To, to, do, to make wine, you have to be able to take the grapes and to turn them into wine. You have to know what you're doing. You have to have the resources to do this. You, 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 there's an art and a craft to it, right? OK, so we have everything relates to nature, but water is in nature everywhere and all the time. Milk is periodic and is associated with the mammalian world and with procreation. And wine is associated with nature but requires human activity to actually create wine. Torah is water, wine, water, milk, and wine. Yes? In other words, there's an element of Torah that requires our ability to put work into it to turn Torah into what Torah is going to be. I don't want to belabor this. Okay. And of course, you have to have a low spirit. This is the story I'm going to leave you with. It's a wonderful story. It's one of my favorite stories, right? Daughter of the Roman Emperor said to Rabbi Joshua, right, you are so ugly. I can't believe how ugly you are. What a pity that your Torah, that your wisdom, right, is stored in such an ugly vessel as you are. Um, um, it's really, I love reading this story uh, because I, I, I think, I think it's, uh, there's, there's a lot here. I'm, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because we need to go. But, um, and, and he immediately turns to her and says to her, where, where, does, where does the emperor keep the wine? What kind of vessels? Uh, do, do, does he keep them in, in clay vessels, right? In ceramic vessels, ceramic bottles of wine? And she says, yeah, sure. And he says, well, the simplest vessels? Really? The emperor? The fine wine of the emperor? Shouldn't they be kept in gold or silver, right? And, and this is basically the story, right? And the emperor's daughter goes, and they, of course, change to silver and gold vessels, and of course, the wine turns, right? Mm -hmm. The wine can't be kept in gold or silver vessels. The wine turns, right? And the emperor says, w w why, why did we do, who told you to do this? What, look at the wine. What did you do, right? Who told you to do this? Oh, so Rabbi Joshua told me to do this, right? So much wisdom in this ugly vessel, he told me to do this, and look at what happened to our wine. Right? This basically is the story. Right? Um, and of course, at the end of the day, this for us is the story. Um, we may not be vessels of gold and silver. Uh, we may not be the best and the brightest we may not be at the top of our game. 
we may be clay vessels. And yes, we may be ugly in one way or another. But it doesn't mean that we cannot be the recipients of Torah, i.e. wisdom. And this story is not just about Torah. It is about the wisdom of Rabbi Joshua stored in that ugly vessel. And I want you to know that this is Tanit's response to Sifre and to the tension of Sifre on Deuteronomy. And I wanted to leave you with a thought and with the idea that maybe this is what Shavuot is about and maybe this is the beginning of our conversation, our discussion, our bigger discussion about relevance that we started out with. So I promised I would let you go in a few minutes and I could speak longer about this, but I'm going to let you go and wish you a happy Shavuot. And thank you for, for bearing with me on this.